Hi, Judy. Hi, Ramla. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Fine. Looking forward to uh, hearing from you and hearing um, hearing your story. I was uh, following a podcast on the Olympic Channel that told me a, a whole lot about you, and it's just such an incredible story. There's so many layers to it that were absolutely fascinating for me and uh, great to be able to chat to you today. It's quite funny actually. We, we've met, well I've met you once. Um, you, you know Nino? Yeah. Nino. Yeah, they were having their annual dinner I think last year and, uh-huh. uh, and Nino said I'd, I'd love to introduce you to Judy and so we met. Oh, that was, was the, the, the one in Ipswich? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, I love it. Love yeah. it. That was a great night. They did that really well, didn't they? Amazing. I loved what I loved most about that night was that all the children got awards. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that uh, you know, I'm, I'm always saying that there is talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And I wanted to ask you about how you got yourself into boxing in the first instance. Yeah. Um, so my my obviously my transition into boxing was probably similar to what most people like like most people how they get into sport i um i was quite an overweight teenager um and to in order to gain a bit of self confidence and love my myself and my body i decided to go to the gym i mean boxing wasn't always on the cards for me i always saw it as quite a violent sport and just walking into the gym and doing my first ever lesson and seeing how much confidence just that one uh, lesson gave me, I, I knew, like, I, I fell in love with it instantly from the very first lesson. So I knew from then, like, I really want to not pursue it because you don't know as, as a young girl if this is something that you want to get into. But I definitely wanted to continue doing boxing and, and seeing how far I could go with it. It was obviously great at the start. Like I was losing weight. I was gaining more confidence. I was making a lot of friends in the gym as well. So that was, you know, obviously a plus. And yeah, so I just took it step by step, week by week, month by month, year by year. And just fell in love with it, I think. I think it's really important, isn't it, that there are facilities that are welcoming and accessible and affordable to everybody if they do want to find a leisure pursuit that they want to follow. And I also think what's really important is everybody wants to belong to something. You just have to find that thing where, and environments are so important, but they're always created by by people. And I, the way that I got into coaching, I. I I've been a tennis player all of my life, but when my kids were small, um, I had to give up my job and a car went with my job and I kind of felt a bit trapped in the house and I went over and joined the tennis club that I'd been a member of um, for many, many years when I, when I was a kid and discovered there was still no coaches or anything really happening for the youngsters at the club. And uh, I just started out volunteering a couple of hours a week and realised that my passion for my sport, I also love sharing it and teaching it. I wasn't a coach, I just was somebody who wanted to try to get others started. And it's quite interesting that when you're starting something from scratch, you realise that you can't do it all yourself. So who do you bring in to help you? You bring in the parents. And for me, it was like building a mum's army. So important for me when I was doing that to open the doors to as many kids as possible, you know, whether and it wasn't about being a member of a club and paying a fee and having a key for the door and that kind of thing. It was a very much community open access. And I think that's really important for keeping kids interested in something. Is, and it's people who make those environments. So I was interested in the, in the boxing thing. The other thing that occurred to me was um, because I read that, um, that you're, you didn't have the family support. It was almost like you had a double life. It was a, it was a secret because you were not allowed to do it and I wanted to hear a little bit more about how you manage that. Yeah, um, for, for, for girls especially growing up in a very strict Muslim family, I mean I'm not saying like sport is like a no-no but definitely a sport considered like purely for men was definitely a no-no. I remember my mum brought us here from Somalia so we came over as war refugees and she didn't envisage like any of her, her children 
taking up sport as a career. She wanted us to do the usual, like become a, become a doctor, become a lawyer, an engineer, those things. So when I first joined, um, when I first started boxing, I knew that it was, if I decided to talk to anyone at home about it, it would, it would automatically be, no, nope, you can't do it got to stop it so I knew because I fell in love with it I couldn't share it with anyone and that was really hard because it's like you said like having that support system at home and like your mom pushing you to you know go to training especially on the days that you don't want to go to like I didn't have any of that and that was really hard and so essentially I had to kind of be my own support system but I had this as cheesy as this is I had the best role model at home my mom she's the best fighter that I've ever met she has been through so much she's watched her son you know die in Somalia she's been robbed of everything she's ever owned she had to work for everything she had to save so much money to just bring us here to the UK and you know if, if she can overcome so many obstacles like that then I, I can I, I can I felt like I could do the same and even though I couldn't confide in her and tell her what I was doing you know I knew the day that she did find out that she would be proud and when she she's found out now and she's like my big supporter she's she's the first person I will call now to to tell when I've got a competition coming up and you know she'll secretly pray for me and you know she'll ask me about how my training is going and you know how my diet is going and you know she she always say to me make sure you don't lose too much weight but she doesn't she hasn't quite grasped that boxing is a weight-based sport <laughs> which is quite funny so anytime you know I, I pop over to the, the family house you know she'll still make dinners that are like inappropriate for me to eat but I'll just <laughs> <laughs> you don't have two bites and <laughs> I feel like she has been, even though I was unable to to tell her and gain her support from a young age, she was the best role model that I ever had and she's now my biggest supporter. We're all products of our environment, aren't we? So as you say, the fight comes from your surroundings. You've seen that fight like way more than most of us will, will, will ever see. Uh, it's such an amazing story. And what about within the boxing club? Was there somebody within the boxing club who was your rock of support in, in terms of your uh, your boxing? To be honest, no. <laughs> I wish there was, but there wasn't. Yeah. I, I moved around boxing gyms so much. Like, it, it's really hard to stay in, in one gym because there will always be... I don't know, a coach that has a problem with you or somebody that has a problem with you. And it's always important to be comfortable in where you're training and to be comfortable in your surroundings. So I'm, I move gyms a lot. And, you know, I did have, you know, some boys that I looked up to because they were achieving so much, but I couldn't like pin an, an individual that I thought, you know, wow. There was this amazing... Um, woman <laughs> her name is Lucia Riker she's she's like she's retired and she used to compete back in the days but she was amazing um she you know started off she started her boxing career quite late and obviously the odds would be if you start late you wouldn't achieve but she went on to be a world champion she's stunning she's beautiful and she's just like she's quite graceful in the ring as well so she 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 was my hero so how how did you how did you study her was this something you could study online or just read about or there's not there's not a lot of um archival footage about her there's there's documentary that was made about her called shadow boxes which i watched a few times actually the film million dollar baby was inspired by that documentary about Lucia Riker and I don't know if you've seen the film but she's she's the girl right at the end who um Hilary Swank fights who uh, right at the end yeah so she she's a hero <laughs> as well yeah I wanted to ask Judy who who was your driving force and who you know 
who did you look up to and who were your role models? <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I had a driving force ever. I think that it all came from me. I think it was, um, when I was a junior tennis player, there were no opportunities for me in Scotland when I finished school and I would have liked to have become part of um, something that would allow me to take my tennis further. But there was nothing in my country. And in Britain, the top six girls were chosen for a squad that was a kind of all expenses paid thing in London. And I was number eight at the time. So I missed out completely. Uh, and I went off on my own for a bit uh, and onto the continent to try to play some tournaments. But, you know, it's tough when you're sort of 16 and a half, 17, you're trying to coach yourself, you're traveling yourself. There's no ATM machines, there's no mobile phones, there's no internet. You're completely disconnected and it potentially it's quite dangerous. Anyway, I didn't last very long. And so this, I think this lack of opportunity for me when I was a junior has really been the driving force for me. Once I got more into coaching at the club and some of the kids got really good, not my own kids, some of the older kids, um, was trying to create opportunities for them. And it just grew from there. And it still grows because I'm still very driven to creating opportunities for others and to sharing what I know. And I'm sure it's because there was nobody to share anything with me. So I think my, my driving force is definitely me, just, just as your driving force was you know was definitely you you spoke earlier about you know losing your job and then wanting to to put your um sons through tennis how hard how hard was it for you having having to do all of that I think um you know I think when my kids started playing tennis you know when they were little they were they played pretty much every sport under the sun except skiing because we didn't have any mountains or any snow where we lived but they tried everything and then like most kids you you pick the two or three that you enjoy the most and for both of them tennis was one of the sports that they enjoyed but they did other things as well it was never never just about tennis in fact when Andy was about 14 and a half he had to make a decision between tennis and football he was doing just as much as uh, both and then it got to the point where he couldn't do both but the difference between him going to football twice a week and a football match on the Saturday was that I paid a pound a time and took my turn of washing the strips once a month and going to tennis, if, especially during the winter, if you needed to book an indoor court, there happened to be four indoor courts near where we lived, which is very uncommon in Scotland, that we have hardly any indoor courts anyway. But back then, you know, when, when the kids were sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, to book an indoor court was back then about 12 pounds an hour. Like nowadays, it's something like 28 pounds an hour. Now, who can afford that? So the difference between what it costs as a parent to put your child through a tennis route versus a football route was massive but Andy made the choice with tennis I'm like, oh, oh, okay but I didn't know what we were getting into we had no idea where we were going because it was all just fun and of course Jamie was was playing as well he was playing at a great level too and you just kind of go with it and I was having to learn not just how to coach but what's the next step what tournament should they be going to and so forth and I learned a lot by attending conferences overseas as part of my job as the national coach and not because I was a great coach because I wasn't, I was passionate, I was inexperienced, but I knew Scotland, I knew my country. And because we had zero infrastructure, nobody else wanted the job, basically that was it. But it was a real eye opener to me because I was going into it as a pretty much a rookie, full of passion and enthusiasm, but I had no idea how expensive it was going to be to develop children as tennis players. So of course that's, that's my remit. And also, you know, Scotland exists as part of Great Britain for tennis. And of course, all the, the power and the money is all in, in, in and around London. So as a British sport, all the national training camps and things are in the London area. So you not only have much more expense to get down to them, it also, you're also spending a lot more time traveling um, to go to things. And I think that when I realized that, when the boys were first invited to British national training camps, I thought, oh, wow, I need to fly down with them to London. I need to either stay with them or stay somewhere to, in order to take them back. And actually what you end up doing is overnight accommodation, three sets of flights, taxis, etc., And you count up the cost of it and you realize, oh my word, this is just gonna be out of our depth. 
and uh, it was a real struggle financially to make things uh, to make things happen. But in an individual sport like tennis, the onus is very much on the parents to make it happen. Whereas if we'd gone down the footballing route, it really would have cost me next to nothing. And if he had become a very top footballer, he'd have been signed up by a club and the club would have taken care of the kit and the fixtures and the training and he'd been paid a huge wage and bonus system and you would never have had to get involved or do anything. So it's, it's a very different thing when it's, a, when it's an individual sport. And of course, there's no guarantees. You never know if anything's coming back or not, but you just want to give them the opportunity and support them on their you know, on their journeys. We had no idea where we were going and we obviously had no idea where they would, where they would end up. But there was three or four years, I think, between the ages of 15 and 18, 19, where you had to borrow a lot of money to make it happen and you have no idea if you're ever going to be able to pay it back. And it was just so difficult to find sponsorship because there's no track record of success of tennis in our country. Uh, and, you know, most people it was sort of like, run along, don't be silly kind of thing. I never forget those people, by the way. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it, it's interesting. But it is, I think it's so important for parents to understand what they are getting into and that's why I think that coaches and gov governing bodies of sport have a duty to really support and advise and inform the parents of what the journey is and I don't think that happens well enough because emotionally financially and time-wise and the impact on the other members of the family it's absolutely it's absolutely massive the other thing that I wanted to ask you about was when you um decided that you wanted to represent Somalia what prompted that decision and how difficult was it to make that transition? So I started off by representing England so I went to the European Championships and it was really hard because I didn't perform how I should have performed so I lost and since that happened it was quite evident that you know, England didn't want me anymore. And it, I was heartbroken because boxing was all I ever wanted to do. And if you can't compete for a country, you can't really compete internationally. And, you know, I'd done everything I wanted to do here in the UK and achieved everything I wanted to achieve in the UK. And so I initially stopped for a period of about six months because I was lost. I didn't know what to do. I, you know, I wasn't doing anything internationally. And I think it was a friend of mine who suggested um, competing for Somalia because I, I hold a passport for Somalia as well. And initially it was really hard because there was no federation set up. There never been any boxer to have competed ever for Somalia. So I had to, me and my husband Richard, it was like a year of back and forth emails between ourselves and the international governing body of boxing. And so after a year, they decided to let me compete. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever come across dealing with African politicians and it's, it's, there's a lot of corruption. And I know they, they get a lot of funding on my behalf from the International Olympic Committee, which I don't receive any of it. So a lot of all, actually all the competitions that I have done in the last four years have come out of my own pocket. So I pay for the flights, the competition fees, the hotels, food transport. And it's been really hard because times that I'm meant to be training, I'm, you know, going on a shoot to make money for my next competition. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been really difficult, but I have to say it's been 100% worth it because I, I get to live my dream. So, so do you, you know, if you're trying to learn for yourself, you know, um, and watch top boxers, male or female, are these are the techniques and things that you study or patterns that, that, that you study? Because that's quite a big thing in, in tennis now to study your opponent to try and find the little chinks in the armor that you can create your battle plan for. Yeah, so, so the thing in, in amateur boxing, so you go, you go to a tournament board, the tournament might last anywhere between five to ten days, and you'll, you could fight any, anything between five and six fights within that period. So what happens is you get uh, drawn, you, you, you'll know who your opponent is before you get in the ring. So what my coach usually does is he'll go online, try and find as much information as possible on that person, study them and say, look, this is the strategy of how you're going to win. 
if you listen to me, you'll do well. <laughs> yeah. Andy loves boxing, absolutely loves it. And he sees huge similarities, you know, with, uh, with tennis because it's the whole... I just said the same thing. He's yeah. the same thing. There's, there's huge similarities between boxing and tennis because you, it's just it's using your arms and your legs at the yeah, same time. Yeah, it's the turning, the rotation as well. Yeah, and the and the you're maneuvering them into a position where you can play the winning shot or the winning punch or you, you know, and yeah, he absolutely loves it. And we have um, David Hay to thank for um, Andy went to watch him training in Miami one year, and I had been desperately trying to convince Andy that he needed a physiologist to look at his diet, his sleep patterns all these things because you know you're flying across continents you're in different countries got different beds every every week it's um and david hay was training in miami and he was training in miami and and uh, we arranged for him to go and watch david hay training and they went for lunch and he came back from the lunch and he said mom you know those protein shakes that jez the fitness trainer's been making me he said there's only about 13 percent of protein in them why am i having them i hate them i've always hated them they make me feel sick and i went well and he goes, David, hey, you know what he does for his protein? Raw seaweed. And I went, hmm. <laughs> anyway, but it was the whole thing. He's going, his trainer told me this, this, this. And he immediately, that was him. He wanted to go down and explore with a physiologist. So I think it's this whole thing of not just sticking within our own sports, but looking to athletes from other sports for ideas, inspiration, support, yeah. advice. I'm trying to train myself to stay away from the fridge and the wine rack at the moment. And it's, uh, it's not so easy. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, with um, boxing, you know, when you got into it, it wouldn't, it probably is a little bit more now seen because there's more opportunities for girls to, to get involved. But how important is the, do you think is all the advances in sporting clothing and particularly as it's become quite a fashionable thing now the leggings and the crop tops and the funky trainers and so forth to getting girls more inclined to get involved in sport well i I've, I've, I've never been a person to be matchy matchy at the moment i'm wearing navy blue orange and black like <laughs> <laughs> for me like clothing is not important but i know uh, some some people feel i think there's some i think there was like a scientific study behind like if you feel good in what you look and how your hair is and you know what you're wearing you're more inclined to go in like to, to go to the gym and work out and you know all these brands that are put, putting out all these you know matching leggings with a matching top and if, if that's what it takes to make people feel better and want to go to the gym then great I, I think that's yeah that's really great yeah I do a lot of work with um, girls one of the programs that I set up um, about four years ago almost four years ago now is called She Rallies and it's actually about building a bigger female workforce of tennis coaches across the UK and uh, it's, it's quite a small program um, but it has now about 58 part, very part-time ambassadors around the country who I trained up and then they go out into their backyards and they train other women to either assist them in delivery or to start out on their own because we found we weren't getting enough female coaches coming in um, to our sport. And I think, you know, the more I look back on my life, I think that when I started out as a volunteer at our club, tennis was such a minority sport in Scotland. Um, there were hardly any coaches, never mind female coaches. So you kind of had to start everything, make everything happen by yourself. And I think, you know, so many of the things that I do now are about sharing and encouraging other women to get involved. And I was loving reading about uh, what you were doing with the, uh, your sessions that you're doing with the Muslim women behind closed doors. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, so how, how I initially started, I got my coach's license because it was just something I wanted to do you know, in case something like boxing is obviously a dangerous sport. One, one thing can happen and that's, that's your whole career stop. So I thought, you know, if something quite serious was to happen to me, what would I want to eventually do? You know, women, especially Muslim women that don't have safe spaces to train. There's not a lot of female only gyms in the, in, in London that I know of. 
and you know they don't have a lot of places where they can go and take their headscarves off and you know just just feel a bit more confident and relaxed and so I decided to start hosting this once a week um, boxing class it's not like a fitness class they they actually mm. learn how to box and they you know learn how to defend themselves which is obviously a plus and a lot of the women so this has been since January of 2018 so it's been going on for two years now I initially thought it was going to be like a three-month project but seeing how how much the girls wanted to continue doing it I you know decided to continue doing it and a lot of them have said have told me how um secure and safe they feel walking alone at night now so you know I've, I've achieved what I've set out to achieve basically which is great I think I think it's absolutely brilliant and I think that all the things that I've done in recent years to encourage more women worldwide to get involved in coaching it's a lot uh, been around bringing just women together just having women only groups because when you work in a very much male dominated environment and I mean I remember the, the last um, coaching qualification I did it was way back like 1995 or something but there was 18 men on it and two women and I remember feeling very intimidated and very much in the minority and terrified to be asked to go out and demonstrate something never asked a question never answered a question and spent the entire year feeling very much on the back foot and it really made me realize many years later when I got the opportunity to work more in a, I suppose, a leadership role within the sport that actually, you know what, if we want to encourage more women into the sport and more women to advance in the sport, we have to bring them together because I certainly find in, in uh, coaches, you, you don't find egos in women coaches and you find much more willingness to network and share. So if you bring them together, you create that, like you said, the confidence, the I'm comfortable, um, I can ask a question, I can solve a question. And we set up things like closed Facebook pages so that they can speak to each other and they can share ideas and so forth. And it just seems to me such a common sense thing to do. And uh, it's been enormously uh, successful. So I think um, if we want to have more women in high positions in business, sport, the arts, whatever, there needs to be career pathways, there needs to be more equal opportunities but i think we as women can all play our part to help somebody else get a step up the ladder and whether that is just grabbing a coffee with somebody and giving them half an hour of your time and your expertise or letting them come and work with you for a day or a week or a month you know whatever it is having somebody in your corner remotely or on the spot uh, can make a huge difference to somebody's confidence to take that step forward into doing something and um, I, I'm such a big believer in women supporting women and women helping to empower others and I think if we all do it and it doesn't matter what your age is what your experience is what your area of expertise is it is valuable to somebody and we can all help each other so I, I'm, I'm all for this female collaboration and uh, women supporting women what, how about you? Yes, I'm the, I'm the same. I'm, I'm all about exactly what you said, females helping females, female, female collaboration. The reason why actually women in boxing don't get paid as much as men is because of, the, because of the support. Like the women don't have as much support as men have. Like women are, are not selling out big shows because, you know, other people, women are not going to support them. And I think what you've said was just spot on. Um, so Judy, uh, I have a question. And my question is, what would you, um, what legacy would you like to leave behind, I suppose? Uh, that, well, that's a, it's, it's a good question because I think, you know, if you are, if, when you start to think about legacy and what you want to leave behind and ensure there's been you know, something that marks what what happened in Scottish tennis with, you know, with Jamie and Andy, all their Grand Slam successes, winning the Davis Cup, becoming world number ones. And I think six or seven years ago, I realized that we were in danger of not capitalizing on it. And so I started a program called Tennis on the Road, which was basically a van full of equipment and myself and another coach, we, we drove it around Scotland and we took tennis into rural and deprived areas 
to give more people the chance to play. And in order to make that a long-term success, what we did was we trained adults within the communities. Anybody who wanted to, parents, teachers, students, youth workers, coaches of other sports, um, and we taught them how to deliver starter tennis to kids and teens and adults in whatever space they had available. Two years ago, I, I morphed it into my own foundation, the, the Judy Murray Foundation. And um, it's quite a small foundation, but we do it really well. And it means that I can be present in it. So um, we have a number of projects across Scotland. We stay in each project for three years. So we really network the whole community and we, we build up this whole community club, school, you know, youth club, this, this whole network of people to deliver our sport. Because it's, it's always bugged me that uh, tennis is, it, it's always deemed to be difficult to do, difficult to access and expensive. Uh, and I wanted to try to smash that. So that I think that's a big part of my legacy. And the other thing that I've been working on for about six years is the creation of a Murray Tennis Centre. Um, hopefully we're very close to pressing a, a green button on that, but that would give me a base to work out of. And I would use that as a community pay and play facility um, for the local catchment, but also use it as a workforce development centre for tennis in Scotland so I can kind of pass on everything that I've learned over the 30 years of starting as a volunteer through club to county to national to international to player box at Wimbledon or whatever so that's a big thing for me and I think the other part of it is the the women's side getting more women involved in coaching and ensuring there is a career pathway for those who do come into it and I, I work as a community ambassador for the WTA which is the Women's Tennis Association so globally they will ask me to go to some of their major events and do community uh, outwork um, with with people in the local area and my favorite part of that is always the workforce build you know the teachers the parents the the coaches um, the students there are so few female coaches involved at the top end of the game in tennis. And somebody said to me, I think it was in 2012, somebody said to me, when you've got a voice, you should use it. And uh, I don't think I've ever shut up since. <laughs> what, what about you? What, what, where, where, what would your legacy look like? Um, what I'd like is for girls who, who look like me and who come from where I come from to be able to not only box but like be able to get into sport and maybe not even just get into but like just have dreams beyond being you know a house some someone's wife someone you know who's staying at home to cook and clean like I want girls to feel like because I can do it and I did it that they also can do it and they you know they they can have those dreams and that's that's and just yeah just dream just dream really high basically and just be able to think that they can you know do and be whoever they want to be Ramla that, this has been great fun it's great to to catch up with you and um we've got a lot in common I think and you know as I said I'm really keen that sports work together that women come together and that we share experiences and and we we try to um, help each other grow in whatever way we can. And I, I'd love to keep in touch with you. And, and if there's anything ever that I can help you or anything that you're doing with, um, feel free to give me a shout anytime. Well, thank you so much. I must admit, like it, it, it has been amazing. So amazing talking with you and getting an insight into your life, you know, your love and your passion for sport and, you know, for women in sport. Like I must admit it, it has been truly inspirational <laughs> and yes I'd, I'd love to stay in touch that that would be amazing great well let's do it <laughs>